Yeah. All right. Uh, this is a room I'm usually pretty comfortable teaching in, and in fact, uh, some of my History of Mexico students who are out there in the audience are going to uh, recognize a lot of what I'm going to be talking about right now. Uh, what I'm going to attempt to do is to place the uh, Zimmerman context into a broader, con or rather the Zimmerman, uh, Zimmerman telegram, into a broader context. Uh, I can still remember uh, taking History 1302 as an undergraduate, of course we didn't call it 1302 in those days, uh, and being amazed at this Zimmerman telegram that we learned uh, helped bring the United States into World War I. And, and I can remember thinking, why in the world would the Germans even take such a risk? What would leave them thinking there was any possibility of Mexico declaring war on the United States? And the good news, folks, is that even though that was a really long time ago, much longer than I would really care to admit, uh, I find that students today ask the very same question. So when I teach the American History Survey class, we get to talking about World War I, uh, and I uh, unveil the, let's see if we can get this here. Perhaps we will not trust technology today. <laughs> I said the tone. We've never trusted technology. Uh, in, in any case, we, we finally get to the uh, Zimmerman telegram, and, and immediately students begin asking the same question that students in my day did. Uh, where did the idea for this thing even come from? Now, now flash forward a few years. Uh, I'm in graduate school. I'm studying Mexican history, in particular modern Mexico. Uh, and the answers suddenly made themselves very, very apparent. And that was to say that if you knew anything about the relationship between the United States and Mexico during the period of the Mexican Revolution, which runs roughly from 1910 uh, until 1920, uh, this would not be a mystery at all. In fact, you would probably conclude, well, why wouldn't the Germans have made this offer to Mexico to declare war on the United States uh, and in turn, to have their previously seized territories of California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas return to them. And so what I wanted to do right now is to give you a brief overview of American-Mexican relations between 1910 and 1917, when the Zimmerman telegram uh, is unveiled. Uh, let me begin with the front seat to a revolution, El Paso, Texas. Uh, not only is it literally on the Mexican border, uh, but it provides a new form of entertainment. Hotels on the border literally sell seats so that you can go up on the roof, order a drink with an umbrella in it, and watch a real live war on the other side of the Rio Grande. Uh, bullets would occasionally zip over their heads, uh, knock off hats. Of course, that was all part of the appeal. We could watch a real live war. Now, the United States government is also interested in watching this real live war for very, very different reasons. It's not so much entertainment value as it is trying to get a handle on who might come to power. After all, President Porfirio Diaz of Mexico was very, very, very friendly to United States and Great, uh, Great Britain's business interests. So despite the fact that Porfirio Diaz is often remembered in Mexico, for the saying, poor Mexico, so far from God, so close to the United States. The reality was, he was a great, great benefactor to foreign business interests. And again, we want to ensure uh, that that uh, yeah, relationship remains the same. One person who would be adamant in ensuring that that relationship remained the same was none other than William Randolph Hearst. Uh, the early 20th century version of Rupert Murdoch, who has enormous investments in Mexico. He wants to ensure that those investments remain safe. Uh, we just happen to have the Bureau of Investigation, before it became the Federal Bureau of Investigation, operating out of El Paso. Now initially, they are there to monitor illegal aliens, and, and not the kind that you would actually think about. They're not there to stop Mexicans from sneaking across the border. They are there to enforce the Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, they were afraid that Chinese, who were now barred from immigrating to the United States, would immigrate instead to Mexico and sneak across the border. And so that's why we have the Bureau of Investigation operating out of El Paso in 1910 when the revolution breaks out. By 1912, when President Woodrow Wilson takes office, uh, the Bureau of Investigation has a new charge. The United States is going to attempt to, shall I say, manipulate or perhaps direct the uh, outcome of the revolution by determining who we will and will not sell weapons to. 
who we will and will not provide funding for. And so it's going to become the job of the Bureau of Investigation to monitor American arms manufacturers and financial interests and to keep tabs on who is meeting with whom at any given time. So again, El Paso, literally front seat to a revolution, whether you're there for the uh, high, high alcohol drinks or whether you're there instead to uh, keep an eye on who's actually selling weapons uh, to which factions in Mexico. Mexicans certainly aren't going to forget this period. Uh, many Mexicans are not overly aware uh, to this day of uh, how instrumental the U.S. role was in determining which factions were armed uh, and which were not. Uh, but what they do not forget is the assassination of their beloved leader, President Francisco Madero. Uh, Fred, uh, President Francisco Madero uh, has taken the uh, uh, proverbial reins from President Porfirio Diaz who, as he boarded a cruise ship to France, turned and looked one more time at his beloved Mexico uh, and exclaimed that Madero has unleashed a tiger, and I hope he can control it. And then, of course, Porfirio Diaz essentially disappears from history, and Madero is the man of the hour. Uh, Madero, however, is not welcomed by many American business interests who are really concerned about his talk about land reform and land ownership. And in fact, by 1917, Mexico will have a new constitution that prohibits foreigners from owning property in Mexico. So this is exactly the kind of talk that is of great concern to the William Randolph Hearsts and Joseph Pulitzers of the world. Uh, it is also of great concern to America's ambassador to Mexico, Henry Lane Wilson. Uh, absolutely no relation to Woodrow Wilson, although they perhaps share a similar mindset. When President, or rather, when uh, Henry Lane Wilson is approached by several Mexican generals offering to overthrow Francisco Madero and to install a much more American friendly government, Henry Lane Wilson jumps at the chance. So, without even checking in with Washington, uh, he is going to give his blanket approval to a plan to remove Madero and his Vice President Pino Suarez from the presidency. And he assures the Mexican generals that the United States government is fully behind this move. And what this is going to lead to is something called La Des uh, Decena Tragica, the tragic 10 days, uh, which uh, literally refers to a period of 10 days in which fighting breaks out between multiple factions in Mexico City. Uh, 5,500 civilians will be dead by the end of this fighting. Uh, also dead. President Francisco Madero and his Vice President Pino Suarez, who will be executed by the very military men who, with whom Lane Wilson engineered the coup in the first place. <clears throat> we might add as well the Veracruz incident, which actually begins with something called the Tampico incident, which is beginning to sound like, well, I don't know, maybe a new trilogy of Jason Bourne movies or something. <laughs> uh, but in any case, the Tampico incident, uh, April 9th, uh, 1914, American soldiers on shore leaving Veracruz are placed under arrest. They're detained. And then they're shortly thereafter let go. The Veracruz incident refers to the demands of the American naval commander in the port of Veracruz. And his demands quite simply were uh, a 21-gun salute, an official apology, and the city of Veracruz raising the United States flag in lieu of the Mexican flag. Uh, President Huerta, as well as the mayor of Veracruz, are more than well, uh, willing to offer the apology. They are not willing to provide a 21-gun salute to an American flag hoisted over a city that, well, for the population of whom, 1846 to 1848 occurred just a few short days ago in their minds. Uh, the result is going to be that the naval commander orders the shelling and uh, military occupation of the city of Veracruz. And just wanted to put this in context, uh, the occupation lasts for about a month, the, the duration of, or the whole of uh, April 1914. Uh, estimated 300 Mexicans uh, dead, 250 wounded, these are actually soldiers, and an unknown number of civilians killed during the fighting. Uh, in fact, uh, very much, uh, very, very well remembered today uh, is the fact that the mayor of Veracruz approached the American naval commander and asked for a short truce so that women and children could evacuate the city. And that was not given. So again, uh, a, a lot of bad blood in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, between the connivances of uh, Henry Lane Wilson with various Mexican revolutionary generals 
and now the American seizure of the port of Veracruz, uh, tensions really heating up between these two North American neighbors. Tensions will heat up further as the United States under President Wilson begins to take a more active and direct role in the revolution. To wit, we're interested in our man winning if we can only determine who our man is. Uh, we have several possibilities. Uh, we have Victoriano Huerta uh, on the left. Uh, we have uh, what I've often thought is the devil's very own uh, Colonel Sanders, Venustiano Cavanza, uh, up here on the right. Uh, Huerta is an old autocrat that would actually like to restore the dictatorship that uh, Porfirio Diaz has abandoned and therefore treat the American and British companies uh, with the same kid gloves that they've been treated with in the past. Uh, Carranza, uh, he's a politician, he's a lawyer, okay, there's no reason to hate him yet, uh, but in any case, he's also a constitutionalist who believes that Mexico will take its place amongst the modern nations of the world upon drafting a new constitution. So th these are really the two stars that the United States is going to have to decide between. Which one of these guys are we going to make the king? Are we going to uh, help to lead to victory in Mexico? Uh, during this period, 1914, 1915, uh, we're going to go back and forth in terms of who we decide we want to sell arms to at any given point. So, for example, after Victoriano Huerta uh, refuses to uh, hoist the U.S. flag over Veracruz, uh, also refuses to offer the 21-gun salute, uh, he's going to briefly be persona non grata. Uh, no, he is not fat. He is just very well armed under that jacket. Uh, he believes in both open and concealed carry at all times. And on the far right, wow, how about this? General John Blackjack Pershing. Uh, these guys are all going to be trying to kill one another in just a few short years. But for now, uh, they are all on the same, well, maybe side is what we would call it at this point in time. Uh, Via, actually a recipient of U.S. largesse, uh, as Victoriano Huerta uh, loses the support of the Wilson administration. Guys like Villa, even Emiliano Zapata, and of course Carranza are there to cash in. Um, interestingly enough, Huerta is going to be the one Mexican revolutionary leader to actually escape Mexico with his life. Okay, something terrible happens to all the rest. So Madero shot by the army. Uh, Felix Diaz shot in combat. Um, Venustiano Carranza, shot by a loyalist. Alvaro Obregón, shot by a waiter. You know, it kind of goes on and on and on. Uh, Emiliano Zapata, shot in an ambush. And Villa, literally shot out of his 1922 Dodge. Uh, it's part of a setup, it's an ambush. A guy steps up and says, Viva Villa! And of course, Villa stops the Dodge to wave to his admirers and immediately is torn to pieces by 30 caliber high powered rifle bullets. Uh, the one that gets away, Huerta, has the perfect opportunity to go off in exile, live a long life. Uh, instead, we're going to find him in the United States in 1915. Or let me, let me rephrase that. The Bureau of Investigation is going to find uh, uh, Huerta in the United States in 1915, meeting with agents of the German government. And guess what they're discussing? Huerta is offering a deal to Germany. Help me retake power in Mexico, and I will declare war on the United States. Wow. So if you've ever wondered, where, where in the world did this idea come from? Uh, well, it was on the table as early as 1915. Now, very shortly thereafter, the American military will invite Huerta to a dinner, and he will die shortly thereafter. Uh, we assume, you can't make this stuff up, we assume poisoning. Uh, the official medical report says, died of cirrhosis of the liver. Now, he was up and bouncing around just fine the night before, the week before, but I understand these things can be somewhat sudden. And at least in the case of Huerta, it turns out to be very sudden. Uh, what really drives the United States closer to the uh, uh, conflict with, uh, uh, with Mexico, or rather with the, uh, the Germans in the Zimmerman telegram, is going to occur on March 9, 1916, when Villistas, about 500 members of uh, Villa's personal army, uh, are going to cross the border into New, uh, uh, New Mexico and raid the town of Columbus. And of course, we actually have a photo here that uh, uh, shows what happens once the Villistas manage to set fire to the main center of town. Uh, what they are, in fact, going to do uh, is spell their own doom. Because American forces who were in Columbus, of course, they couldn't see anything at night. It was dark, about 4 in the morning when the attack took place. 
Uh, now, by the light of the flames, they can actually see whom to shoot. And so they managed to organize a machine gun company. Uh, of the 500 Vistas, about 100 end up dead. Uh, we will end up with eight soldiers and 10 American civilians killed, and immediately there is talk <coughs> of war. And so uh, what we're going to see is the uh, preparation of what becomes known as the punitive expedition. Uh, literally 10,000 American troops invading northern Mexico with orders to capture Villa dead or alive. Uh, and this is where we're going to find American troops, literally getting their training for World War I uh, on the eve of our own declaration of war. So we're going to learn all kinds of interesting things. Uh, for example, this will be the first use of uh, American aircraft in war. Uh, we discover that they don't have fuel gauges, and that proves to be problematic. <laughs> uh, we also manage to shoot and kill uh, quite a few Mexican soldiers. Turns out that the Mexican army is not very happy with the American army being on Mexican soil yet again, so recently after the uh, unfortunate events of 1846 to 1848. And uh, in fact, one of the individuals who ends up shot, uh, merely wounded, is actually Villa, who still manages to escape uh, his U.S. pursuers. So, when the Zimmerman telegram is issued and the United States ends up going to war, what I now tell my students is, based upon the kind of things we've talked about, why wouldn't Germany have entertained the possibility of Mexico declaring war on the United States and thereby preventing the American arrival in Europe? So again, uh, not a really big surprise. We take a look at the uh, Zimmerman telegram in the context of the Mexican Revolution, and it seems all too obvious. It almost seems as though, in hindsight, there was no other option. Thanks, folks.